Uh, introducing our speaker uh, this morning is someone we've wanted, well, not, well, the introducer too. We're glad to have you here, Ed. But we've really wanted Lauren Winter here, but I, <laughs> for a long time. But Ed is, uh, is new, or fairly new to the, the faculty here. He's the uh, Associate Professor of Philosophy and Assistant Professor of Political Science. And he knows our speaker well. And Ed, would you please introduce our speaker this morning? Good morning, Westmont. It is a pleasure to be with you all today, and it is a pleasure to have the opportunity to introduce our speaker today. Professor Winner's visit is sponsored by the Lilly Foundation's NetView grant. That grant, which has been bringing speakers to campus throughout this year and the next, aims at encouraging the intellectual and theological exploration of vocation, or calling, in our community. And to this end, we are very excited to have Lauren Winner with us. Lauren grew up in North Carolina and Virginia, the precocious daughter of a Jewish father and a Southern Baptist mother. By parental decree, she grew up Jewish and took this commitment so seriously that she formally converted to Orthodox Judaism. But even as she was growing ever deeper in her love and understanding of Judaism, a funny thing happened. She felt wooed by Jesus Christ and was baptized after she graduated college and was studying at Cambridge. She writes about these experiences in her first book, the very well-received bestseller, Girl Meets God, a memoir about her spiritual journey. And she has continued to write about spiritual practice in a series of books that followed. Mudhouse Sabbath discusses several Jewish spiritual practices that Christians would do well to emulate. Real Sex talks about sex and chastity. Still chronicles a period of doubt and crisis within her life. Her most recent book, Wearing God, explore some of the overlooked metaphors that the Bible uses to describe God and how these metaphors might deepen our understanding of God and our own spiritual lives. Lauren Winner is an assistant professor at Duke Divinity School where she teaches and writes on matters of Christian spirituality and religious practice. Let me mention that Professor Winner will also be delivering a lecture this afternoon entitled Beyond the Calm Waters, some musings on women and Christian higher education. That talk is at 3.30 this afternoon in the Hieronymus Lounge in Kerwood Hall. But for now, please join me in welcoming Lauren Winner to Westmont. Thank you, Westmont. Let me make sure my computer's actually on because I'm going to be talking from notes. Um, hmm. I hope I'm going to be talking from notes. There we go. So... About 12 years ago, um, when I was in my mid-20s, I was invited to give a talk at Gordon College outside of Boston. And like today, on that occasion, my assigned topic was vocation. And I was pretty excited to talk about vocation because as a person in my mid-20s, I've been out of college for a couple of years and I was in the middle of doing a PhD. I was kind of obsessed with questions about vocation. so. It wasn't at all clear to me that God wanted me to finish my PhD, and I wondered if I was being called to ordination in the Episcopal Church, and I'd written two books, and I was wondering if I should write any more of them, and I was kind of wondering if I would get famous if I did write more of them. I wondered if maybe I should just, like, chuck grad school and try to get a job as a journalist. I wondered if I should just, like, drop out of professional life altogether and move to a farm and try to become like Wendell Berry, etc. So I had a bachelor's degree from an Ivy League university and a master's from Cambridge, and I was awash in lots of delicious options. And I wondered which of them God wanted me to do. And so I was super excited to be invited to give a talk on vocation. And then, about a week before I went to Gordon, I read a book that had just been published called The Dancing Girls of Lahore. It is an ethnography, a, a sociological study of a family in Lahore, Pakistan, and this is a family of prostitutes. So the scholar who wrote the book focused on the mother, who was a prostitute, and on her three daughters, and those daughters, it was totally clear from this book, those daughters were going to grow up to be prostitutes, period. There was no plausible scenario in which those three girls 
were not going to grow up and work in the sex trade. That was the business they were born into, and that was the business they were going to stay in. And I read this book, and it just stopped me dead on the topic of vocation. The book suggested to me that every question I had been asking about my so-called vocational life had to be wrong. More precisely, the book showed me that everything I was saying about my vocation was really just a mark of my privilege masquerading as piety and discernment. It seemed to me suddenly that God could not possibly have one approach to vocation for middle-class, well-educated Americans and then have an entirely different approach to vocation for poor girls born to a woman who worked in the sex trade in Pakistan. And it seemed to me that from that point forward, everything I was going to say ever again about vocation, mine or anyone else's, everything I was going to say about my vocation had to equally be a plausible thing you might say if you were thinking about those three girls in Lahore. So this led me to feel deeply chastened and to think that my speech about vocation also needed to be chastened. So I felt chastened, but in the chastening, I what I didn't do was then like forge a bold, new, interesting way of talking about vocation. Rather, I just sort of stopped thinking about the category at all. And I even kind of stopped using the word vocation for a while. And then last year, when your professor, Ed Song, invited me to be part of this series on vocation, um, I was again excited. So I understand that I am the fourth speaker this year who has focused on vocation and that you've heard from a lawyer and a teacher and a poli-sci professor. And so when Ed invited me to give a talk on vocation, I was pretty excited in a way that was similar to how I was excited 12 years ago at Gordon because in a way that is actually distressingly similar to how I felt when I was in my mid-20s, I'm sort of again in a muddle about what I should be doing with my professional life even as I'm nearing 40 years old. It turns out you can't go to the Career Services Center and ask for a vocation. And it turns out that what you are doing with your life in the realm of work might change. You might hit 40 and have a lot of questions about it. I kind of suspect that if I make it to 50 or 60, I might have questions about it then too. So I have about 20 minutes left with you this morning, and in that time, I want to do three things. I want to tell you a little bit about my own path, not the path I took to my profession, but the path that I took to Christianity. And then I want to lay out some broad suggestions of what I think is a theologically sound way to think about vocation and a biblically sound way to think about vocation. And then I'll say a few words about how I think about all of this in the context of my own actual work, which is the work of writing and teaching at a divinity school and working as an Episcopal priest. And I'll be on campus all day, so if anyone wants to talk one-on-one -on -one about divinity school or the writing life or any of those specifics, I'd be happy and honored to do that. But I want to tell you first a little bit about how I became a Christian, because it is in becoming a Christian that my vocation rests. So as Ed just said, I grew up Jewish. And um, as many of you may have chosen to come to Westmont because of the robust life of faith here, I chose to go to Columbia University in New York as a college student because there was a very robust, vital, engaged Jewish student community there. And I was sent off by my synagogue community to college in New York, and I think everyone thought I was going to come back a conservative rabbi. I think that was like the long-term plan. Certainly no one thought I was going to come back an Episcopalian. Um, so I don't have one of those compellingly dateable conversion narratives. Like I cannot tell you that I became a Christian at 11.03 in the morning on January 22nd, 2002 or something. Um, rather, I had this somewhat drawn out set of experiences over college that kept drawing my attention to Jesus and that culminated in my being baptized 
uh, my first year in grad school. So I'll just tell you two of those experiences that happened to me in college. Are there any college sophomores here? Sophomores? Okay, good. So beware of your dream life. Um, when I was a sophomore in college, I dreamed that my friend Michelle and I and some other women friends uh, were kidnapped by a group of mermaids. And we were taken underwater and we didn't like grow tails or sprout fins or gills, but somehow we could function totally fine underwater. Um, and mer society, it turns out, is, is quite advanced. And also the mermaids are pretty nice captors. They didn't keep us like locked away in a dark room. Rather, we were free to do whatever we wanted to do down there in mer society. We just couldn't go home. So we were, we were down there for about a year, and then after about a year, a group of men came to rescue us, and I will say, as an aside, that I've always been sort of troubled by the gender dynamics of this dream, where all of the victims were women and all of the rescuers were men, but we can talk about that at 3.30. Um, so most of the men who were involved in this rescue effort were like kind of paunchy, middle-aged, graying, NFL-watching types of men. Um, but one of them, one of them looked exactly like Daniel Day-Lewis. Now, remember, this was like 20 years ago, so do not picture the Daniel Day-Lewis of the Lincoln biopic. Like, cast your imaginations back to the young, gorgeous Daniel Day. Um, so I knew that he had come to rescue me, right? So we were rescued by this group of men, including Daniel Day Lewis, and we went back to our regular lives, and then I woke up. Now, I have strange dreams pretty much every night. What was different about this dream was that I woke up totally certain that the dream had come from God, and the dream was not about Daniel Day Lewis. The dream instead was about Jesus Christ. So you might say, aha, Lauren, you said you didn't have a dateable conversion, but right there is your dateable conversion. That's it, that dream. And maybe that's one way of putting it, but I kind of freaked out. Like I had this dream and there's not actually a whole lot of room in the observant Jewish life for thinking that God is sending you dreams about Jesus saving you. So I had the dream and I thought intensely about the dream for a little while and then I sort of shelved it. And then I'll say a second thing that happened to me in college that turned my attention to Jesus. Um, I was that I read a book, and I would love to tell you that it was Dostoevsky or Karl Barth or someone, but it was actually it was two books. It was the first two novels of a series of novels known as the Mitford novels. These are not great literature. Your mother might have read them. They are like middle brow Christian fiction. Um, they don't really have plots. The main character is an Episcopal priest named Father Tim, and you just sort of follow Father Tim as he ministers to his neighbors and his parishioners, and he has a dog who is controlled not by the normal canine commands, but rather is controlled by the recitation of scripture verses. <laughs> and he falls in love with his next door neighbor, who's a children's writer who has great legs, and they get married and f foster some kids. Anyway, nothing really happens in the books. I read, I read these first two Mitford novels. There eventually were nine of them. I read the first two the summer before my senior year of college, and I was just hooked. And what hooked me in these novels was the depiction of a life of faith. All of the characters seemed to live lives that were just totally infused by faith in every corner and every divot of their lives. And I saw that fictional depiction of a life saturated by faith and I, and I wanted it. So things like that happened to me in college and eventually I graduated from college and I went to graduate school in England and in England, I was baptized, and if you press me for the date at which I became a Christian, I would give you my baptismal date. Um, so I was baptized when I was 21. And I tell you all of that because I believe deeply that it was in meeting and being befriended by Jesus, and it was in being baptized and becoming a member of Christ's body, the church, I believe deeply that it is in those happenings that my vocation lies. 
not in the fact that I was a history major at Columbia University in the great city of New York. So, as I said a few minutes ago, that book about the women in Pakistan left me thinking that Christian speech about vocation should be chastened. And here is what I've come up with, and chastened indeed it is. I would propose to you that Christian vocation talk has been taken over in the last generation or two by a highly individualistic idiom. We agonize in a highly individualistic frame about what specific world-changing thing God wants me to do. And I'd like to suggest bluntly that we should stop doing that. Rather, we should talk more basically about the vocation of the baptized, the vocation of worshiping God, loving neighbor, serving the Lord, and doing acts of mercy. Christian speech about vocation needs, I think, to be grounded in a basic account of how Christians see the world. So, so just as a refresher, here's how we see it. Here's how we as Christians see the world. God created the world, and God created it good, in fact, perfect. But the fall occurred, and sin was unleashed, and the fall damaged everything. And now, in the calling and election of Israel, in the sending of Jesus Christ, now God is working a work of redemption. Or to put that differently, now God is bringing about healing. God is healing all the damage that the fall unleashed. And we are working at our vocation, that is, we are listening to the call of God in the middle of that, in the middle of this creation, fall, redemption story. And as baptized people, I think we are called most elementally to two things. First, we are called to be agents of God's healing. When we can be, we should rub God's balm on ourselves and on our friends and on the cosmos. And second, we should try to do as little damage as possible. So let me just dilate for a moment on healing and damage as part of fleshing out our basic account of how Christians see the world. So sin, in the Christian vocabulary, sin is the thing that is ushered in by the fall and that produces all the damage. That is, the word sin denotes those things that human beings and other creatures with agency, so like angels are other creatures with agency, sin denotes the things that creatures with agency do and have done that draw creation away from God and that further unleash damage in the world. The principal effect of the fall is damage. And because we human beings have agency, we sustain damage, we get damaged, and then we immediately intensify the damage by doing things that cause further harm. At the same time, we human beings are creatures with an agency that is being rehabilitated by God. Our agency is being healed by God. And so sometimes we don't just extend the damage, sometimes we do things that make things better and more beautiful and healed. And this, it seems to me, is a good basic frame for Christian thinking about vocation. As human beings living after the fall and living before redemption is complete, we can and we inevitably sometimes will perpetuate damage. But because we are being rehabilitated by God, we also can and sometimes will do things that help God heal the cosmos. So what then is it that Christians are called to? We are called to try to extend God's healing and to try to refrain as much as we can from extending damage. And as long as we're on that terrain, I honestly think it doesn't matter very much what we do, like as a job. Do what pleases you. 
do what will keep a roof over your head. Of course, even trying to do that requires some tricky discernment because it can actually be really hard to know what pleases you, right? But as long as you're extending healing and as long as you're refraining as much as you can from extending damage, it really doesn't matter if you're a lawyer or a mechanic. And it's pretty good news, ultimately, to think that our call just boils down to this basic baptismal identity and that our call just boils down to the basic baptismal call to be agents of God's healing and to try, when possible, not to extend sin's damage. It's good news because it means our job title doesn't define us, right? And I say that as someone who totally loves my job and thinks that I've had the best and most fun job ever for the last 15 years. Nonetheless, our job title doesn't define us, and what we are called to is something more basic and elemental than a job. So I love my job, but the job could vanish. The American economy is changing. You could have a job when you graduate from Westmont, and then like 20 years from now, that job could be done by a robot or something, right? So the job is not where your identity exists or rests. Your identity rests in your baptism and your relationship with Jesus Christ. So I was ordained about four years ago to the priesthood in the Episcopal Church. Um, that was a very long process. The Episcopal Church being what it is, it involved lots of committees. And I was asked in this process if I could say that God was calling me to the priesthood. And I was really quite stymied by this question. I really, really, really wanted to be a priest, but honestly thought God didn't really care much one way or the other whether I was one or not. And I felt this coming from God, not in an indifferent way and not that God was being cold, but rather I felt it from God as a blessing. I felt that God was saying to me, Lauren, there are like lots of things we could do together, you and I. If, if you want to do them as an ordained person, fine. That's good. We can do that. If not, there are lots of other ways that we can do some good things in the world together. So I talked for several years with my spiritual director about this. And, and could I answer the question, are you being called to the priesthood? Could I answer it with a yes? And since I felt that God didn't really care one way or the other, I really felt that I couldn't answer this question with a yes. And then finally one day... I said to my spiritual director, I think God is the leaven in the loaf of my desire to be a priest. And my spiritual director said, that is a statement of call. To say that you are called to something does not have to mean that you think it is the only thing that God wants you to do, and it does not have to mean that it's the thing you're going to do forever. Rather, to say that you are called to something means simply that the thing has some capacity for healing and limited capacity for damage and that God is the yeast or the leaven in your desire to do it. So by that definition, I could be called to like 903 things. I could be called to go to law school or I could be called to teach at Duke for the next 40 years or I could be called to wait tables. There is something I realize there is something a bit deflating about talking about vocation in this way. And in fact, I mean to be deflating. It is God who calls and God who gives. We don't do the calling. And precisely because we don't do the calling, I think we shouldn't inflate our sense of things. There is, by the way, an analogy between how Christians speak of vocation and also how we often think of speak, speak and think of romance and marriage. Specifically, we often say there is one true love, right? One person God is calling us to be with. And if we miss that person, we've somehow missed the boat. And similarly, we often say there's a specific job or career God is calling us to. And if we miss that, we've missed the boat. And in both instances, I think that that is inflated romantic hogwash. There are many jobs we could have and many people we could love. And there's another similarity between vocation talk and romance and marriage talk. And that is, although it's true that you could love lots of people, once you've actually taken up the task of loving one of them, one specific person, 
then what you're called to do is figure out how to love that particular person well. And the fact that you could have loved 75 other people kind of recedes into the background. So similarly, once you're in a specific job or profession, there is good reason to spend some time figuring out what the calling of that profession is and then do it at its best. That's why it's good that your first three chapel talks this year on vocation were specific and granular, not this like highly abstract theology of vocation, but one person's work as a lawyer and one person's work as a teacher and one person's work as a politics professor. So I think God would have been perfectly pleased if I'd gone to law school after college or become a pastry chef. But what I, in fact, wound up doing for these last 15 or 20 years is trying to have some semblance of an intellectual life, a life in which I write and teach and preach. I've done this very far from perfectly. But I've kind of chipped away at it. And along the way of chipping, I've learned a few specific things about the contours of intellectual work. I have learned that intellectual work takes time, and I tend not to give it the time that it needs, and that's a failing, and it's a failing that's been costly to me, and I ought to repent of it. I've learned that I should really try not to let the tail wag the dog. Like, I would actually have a way more successful career as a writer of books if I were on Facebook and if I tweeted. But I would feel hollowed out inside and I would hate life every day if I did those things. So, I don't. I would urge you to figure out when you land in a job, what's the core for you? What's the heart of it? And what are the non-core things that are just the tail wagging the dog? And then to the extent that you cannot let the tail wag the dog, don't. Early 20th century, Dominican A.G. Sertiange wrote a book called The Intellectual Life. And in that book, he talks about what you have to have in the intellectual life. He talks about how much sleep you have to get and how much exercise you ought to get. And in particular, he talks about the centrality of solitude to the vocation of the intellectual. He says if you have landed in the intellectual life, then part of your vocation is solitude. Then he writes, solitude enables you to make contact with yourself. And if the Holy Spirit, he says, has led you into the interior region of solitude, then you should offer God the solitude that God has created. I think that is totally beautiful, and I don't know if it really applies to anything other than the life of a writer. I don't know if it applies to being a computer programmer or a waitress, but there must be some parallel wisdom for computer programmers and waitresses. And so if you become a programmer or a waitress, figure out what your wisdom is and then roll with it. So that's a few very basic principles about vocation. Try to fill your time with things that extend God's healing as much as possible and extend sin's damage as little as possible. And once you find yourself in a particular kind of work, whether it is teaching or preaching or doctoring or waitressing or computer programming, etc., once you find yourself there, set about discovering not what you are called to do, but rather what computer programmers and waitresses are called to do and then do that thing. When you can, do it beautifully. And when you can, have fun doing it. And try not to exhaust yourself too much, but when you do exhaust yourself, realize that exhaustion is sometimes par for the course and don't beat yourself up about it. That's all, I think. In my view of vocation, that's what it boils down to. I hope to see many of you today at 3.30 in Hieronymus Lounge, and I hope that you will join me now in a concluding word of prayer. <laughs> applause can be prayer too. Thank you for the applause. Father God, thank you for your presence here today. Thank you for your presence in the life of this community and in the life of every individual here. 
I ask that you would amplify your presence among us today as we depart from this place. As we depart, I ask that if there is something I said that is displeasing to you, I ask that you would strain it out and we can leave it behind. And if there is something that I said that someone in particular needs to hear, I hope that you will underline that word for that person and that you will send each of us forth from this place clearer and more empowered in doing the work of bearing your cross and proclaiming your kingdom in the world. We pray this in the name of the triune God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you.